Several years back, a Christian man and his co-worker had a discussion about the then recently deceased Princess Diana. This is 1997, by the way. The co-worker was sure that she had just gotten the, in the express way to heaven because of all of her great humanitarian work. The man replied with, uh, in spite of the fact that she was an unrepentant adulteress, and the co-worker came back with the standard, we should not judge someone before we've walked a mile in his or her shoes. The man replied, well, but regardless of the way Prince Charles treated her, it's still no excuse for sin. And the, went back and forth like that and got a little bit uh, more heated after that response. But the co-worker's attitude is largely reflective of the mindset of a growing number of people in the United States and abroad, and even more so today than in 1997. That mindset is that we have to be tolerant of others' viewpoints uh, and uh, uh, their religions and their lifestyles, even lifestyles that are clearly prohibited by Scripture. Even lifestyles that the, that the Word of God clearly says are not acceptable to God. And they love quoting Matthew 7, verse 1 to us, don't they? Judge not, lest ye not be judged. I'd like to do it in the King James, too, because it makes it sound more regal, I guess. How do we respond to that? When we dare to point out something is sin that not everything is right, that some things are wrong, when we dare to do that, when we, uh, are we really being judgmental? When we have the audacity to tell or say some, that some actions are flat out sinful, are we really being intolerant? Especially if it's one of those quote-unquote political hot-button issues. Today I want us to look at tolerance and judgmentalism in light of God's Word. And my purpose today is to uh, show what the Bible really says about tolerance and how to answer the charge of being intolerant. There are essentially two things we need to know, do in, this, in all of this. And the first is we need to know the issues. Know the issues. What do I mean by that? I mean we need to know what we're talking about. We need to know what we're talking about when we use, when confronting a challenge uh, to, to biblical teachings and convictions. We need to, first of all, we need to understand the issue or the term tolerance. Now, when we're seeking to understand a term, oftentimes the very best thing to do is to, well, define it. And if we're going to define a term, especially when we're preaching and teaching and talking about Bible, we will always want to go back to the original, to the Greek language, and to see what the Bible says about the term, how the Bible uses the word. Well, this term does not appear in the Bible. It's, it's not in the Bible anywhere. Uh, so we have to look for principles that are involved with it. But while the term tolerance does not appear in the Bible, it does happen to appear in the American Heritage Dictionary, where it says it is the capacity for or practice of recognizing and respecting the opinions, practices, or behavior of others. So we keep that in mind, that definition and so forth. And we go, and now we want to look at using the term. How are we going to use the term now that we know sort of kind of what it means? But when talking about tolerating something, what usually comes to our mind? Usually what comes to our mind is we put up with something that we really don't like. The very best illustration of this that I could possibly come up with is that I tolerate peas. Okay? I don't like peas. If you give me a choice, I'm not going to eat peas. But if they're served on the table, I will eat peas. Found that out shortly after I got married. You eat what's put on the table or 
bad things happen. So anyway, um, I'm not just saying that because she's not here today. And, you know, uh, but I, I tolerate these. I don't like them, but I'll tolerate them if they are served. Uh, in the same way, I tolerate people's opinion about me. But that doesn't mean that I agree with it or that I condone it or that I accept it as, at face value. When you tolerate something, you are putting up with something that you don't like or enjoy. But the world has a different approach, especially uh, increasingly so today. Many online dictionaries, if you ask, look, look up the word tolerance, it, it reflects this changing and evolving, if you will, viewpoint and approach. The world's approach is we have to not only recognize and respect a different opinion, practice, or behavior, we have to embrace that behavior and celebrate it. That being the case, I should have to eat peas at every meal. But that's not going to happen, is it? That's not really what is meant by tolerance. And it, but, but the world says if we don't, embrace and celebrate these differences, then we are intolerant, then we are judgmental, then we are a bigot, etc., etc. And then they throw Jesus' own words in our face. Judge not lest ye not be judged. But the word doesn't mean acceptance. And it certainly doesn't mean celebration. And if someone tells you that you don't have the right to believe as you do, then you really need to remind them that they are not being very tolerant based on their own definition of what tolerance is. So then we've talked about the term tolerance. Let's talk about understanding the term judge. Because the term judge is a little bit easier because it does appear in Scripture for us. It appears in Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Is Jesus, when he says this, really saying not to judge at all? No, he's not. The point that Jesus is making is to avoid judging with an inappropriate sense of moral superiority over another person just because of that person's moral failures. What he is doing is he is condemning the holier-than-thou attitude expressed by people even in his day, specifically the Pharisees. Remember in Luke 18, the Pharisee and the, the tax collector's prayers that uh, Jesus tells the parable about? How the Pharisee prayed, God, aren't you glad that I'm so great? And that, that's the attitude that Jesus is condemning. We can be reasonably certain of this because if you look at John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus himself says, Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. If Jesus in Matthew 7 condemns any and all judging, then in John chapter 7, he says, make a right judgment, then Jesus contradicts himself. Jesus never contradicted himself. Never. So, according to John 7, 24, where do we get the standard to make a right judgment? Where do, where, what do we use to base a right judgment on? The internet, of course. Right? No. Talk radio. That's good. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, big wig, big name, big wig religious leader who's popular and has sold a lot of books and so forth. Where we should no. What we base that decision on, what we use as a standard to make a right judgment is the unchanging, inerrant, totally reliable, inspired Word of God. That's what we use to make these judgments on. If the Bible condemns it, it is to be condemned. If the Bible commends it, then it is to be commended. There's no need for a public opinion survey on the issue. There's no need, as some churches are known to do, to, to publish position papers and say this is what we believe about this subject and, uh, and everything and so this is what we don't need to, we, we've got our position paper right here 
This is our position paper. There's no need to debate it or even really discuss it. God has settled it if He says it in His Word. And even when the Bible is quote-unquote silent about something, we can find principles to apply in those areas. So we've looked at the term tolerance and we looked at the term judge. What's the point? What point am I trying to make this morning? Well, the person who uses Matthew 7.1 as a cure-all for judging doesn't really know the context. If they, if they would read the Matthew chapter 7, they would understand this. In fact, if they would just go on to verse 2, for with whatever measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus is saying there are times to make judgments. Make sure that the measure you use is the Word of God. But then they could also read a little bit further. Verse 15 and following of Matthew 7. Where Jesus calls some people wolves in sheep's clothing and evildoers. Sounds pretty judgmental to me, especially by today's standards, don't you think? Besides, they are guilty of what they condemn us for. they taking a verse out of context and using it for their own purposes. And not only that, the person who does this contradicts themselves. They really do. They, they contradict themselves when they say they are not being judgmental about something. Then they are really judging that thing to be acceptable, so therefore they are making a judgment. Are they not? And they are judging that our opinions are unacceptable. Do you see the problem with that? Do you see how, how it's a no-win situation for them? The principle to keep in mind is this. When applying God's Word to, do, to any issue, you know, pick whatever issue, a political issue, a social issue, whatever type of issue you want to, to do this for. When you apply God's Word to an issue, we are not judging God is judging through His Word. We are merely communicating God's judgment. And if you keep this in mind, and if you communicate that to others, then you can help them to see that their argument is not with you. Their argument is with God. Because God is the one who has judged whatever to be right or wrong. Just make sure, though, your position is based on Scripture and built on Scripture, not just your personal opinion or preference. Know the issue. Know how to define tolerance and judging. And when you know these things, then you can move on to the next point. Because if, when it comes up, you need to know how to respond. Ephesians 4.15 urges us to speak the truth in love. Two ways to respond to the charge of being judgmental and intolerant. Number one is respond with truth. Respond with truth. And truth is a multifaceted diamond, we might say. First type of truth is spiritual tr scriptural truth. What's scriptural truth? John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus says to the Jews who believed in Him, if you hold to My teaching, you are really My disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we're to hold to His teachings. How are we going to hold to His teachings if the only time we crack open the Bible is on Sunday morning when we're here? How are we going to know His teachings if we don't ever really dive in and study what He taught? We're not. So if we know His teachings and we understand His teachings, then we know the truth. And the truth will set us free. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. If we want to get to the Father, we've got to go through Jesus. If we're going to go through Jesus, we've got to go through what He taught and know what He taught about issues and things of that nature. So respond with truth, scriptural truth, and respond with logical truth. By this I mean when they tell you you're being intolerant, ask them what they mean by being intolerant. If they reply something along the lines of not being accepting of another's beliefs, 
Then once again, you mention that they, by their own definition, are being intolerant of your views. Because you don't see eye to eye on something, does that mean that uh, they have to accept you? if they're going to be tolerant according to their own definition. To be consistent, they cannot legitimately criticize another's point of view, even your view, even though it's the opposite of what their view is. They can't, they can't do it if they want to be logically honest and have logical truth. So scriptural truth, logical truth, and exemplary truth. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11 tells an interesting story. A woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now how the woman was caught in the act of adultery and the man was not, I don't know. Kind of leads me to think that this was something of a setup. So anyway, they bring the woman that was caught in the act of adultery to Jesus and they throw her down in front of him and they say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. Now what do you say? And they think they've got Jesus right where they want him. They think, okay, he's not going to be able to get out of this. So what does Jesus do? He doesn't answer him at all. He bends over and he starts writing on the ground. He stands up. And he says, in verse 7, which is another verse that sometimes gets thrown in our face, if any of you is without sin, let him throw the first stone. Been over and started writing in the ground again. And slowly, one by one, all of them, starting with the oldest ones, going on down to the youngest ones that were there, they all left. And a lot of times, people want to stop there in the story. They want to stop there and say, see, Jesus said, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. So you can't throw stones because you're not without sin. And he said, wait, 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 look, look at verse 11. Don't miss verse 11. Jesus' final instructions to her. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, she says. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of less than desirable behavior. No. Go now and leave your life of sin. He doesn't mess around. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't say, well, it's just a, it's just a little thing, okay? He says, go now and leave your life of sin. He did not condone her sin. He was against the hypocritical condemnation by sinful man. He knew it was a setup. It had to be a setup. And he turns the trap on the religious leaders. But still, tells the woman to leave her life of sin. Respond with truth. But at the same time, Again, Ephesians 4.15 says, Speak the truth in love. We need to respond with the truth, but we also need to respond with love. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4-7 through 7 tells us about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily, easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. If we respond with love, we will respond with patience and kindness. If we respond with love, we will not respond with violence of any sort or an anger of any type. We will simply respond with patience and kindness. 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26 tells us, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must, keep, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. 
Those who oppose Him, He must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do His will. Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. Tell me something. Where does getting into a shouting match come into play? Even if it's not an actual, literally, but a virtual shouting match on social media or anything of that nature. Where does that come into It doesn't. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must gently instruct in hopes that they will come to their senses. Folks, no one's going to come to their senses if all we're doing is shouting and screaming at them and telling them how wrong they are. They might come to their senses if we say, you know, let's, let's not pay attention to what I think or what you think. Let's pay attention to what God thinks about something. And let the Word of God do the talking. That's how you gently instruct. And that's how they will come to their senses. You know, even when we disagree with someone, we must treat them with respect. We must gently instruct them in what the Bible says, teaching them the truth in love. We must respond with pity and compassion, but never compromise, just like Jesus did. When the Bible condemns an activity... We must side with the Bible, regardless of what society says, regardless of what is politically correct, regardless of what the latest opinion poll says, regardless of what the cost is. And it may cost us. It may cost us a job. It may cost us a friendship. It may cost us family members. But you know, there's one thing it won't cost us. Siding with the Bible, going with Jesus' teachings on any quote-unquote controversial issue, the one thing it won't cost us is our soul. And that is what we value more than any job, more than any friendship, more than even a family relationship. Part of the problem is that as a society, we have stopped calling sin what it is. Sin. We call it things like foibles or uh, things of that nature, things that are a little bit less offensive. In the name of tolerance and being non judgmental, we have adopted an attitude that reflects the worldly viewpoint that we cannot call sin, sin. We seek to excuse it if we even acknowledge it, don't we? Some people go so far as to blame God for their own sin claiming that God made them in a way that is predisposed to XYZ behavior, which is sin. So for the next several weeks, we're going to engage in a serious study of sin. Specifically, we're going to start with the Gospel's answer to various aspects of sin. But for right now, what I want to let you know is that God loves you. He loves you so much that He sent Jesus to die for you. And you know, He loves your friends so much that He sent Jesus to die for them. He loves your family so much that He sent Jesus to die for them. So are you sharing God's love with your friends? And with your family? Or are you letting some sort of fear that they might think that you're being intolerant keep you from that? Folks, you're not being intolerant when you share the gospel with someone. You're showing them more love and more compassion than you know that you are. You're showing, you're showing and sharing with them the love and the compassion of God. Maybe somebody's done that for you. And you're ready this morning to put on the name of Jesus in baptism, being immersed in, the, in that watery grave for the forgiveness of your sins. If so, there is no reason for you not to take advantage of this opportunity. Or maybe you've done that. But since that time, you've been intolerant. Not intolerant 
of what the, like the world says, but intolerant of what God says. And you want to start letting that be your compass to get you through life. If so, we want to help you. And we will help you. If that involves a public response for prayer, then we encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. If it involves a private response for prayer, just you and God, then we encourage you to make that response as well. But if you need a public response to make things right between you and God this morning, don't let anything keep you from making that response right now as we stand and sing together.